Hello and welcome to Talkernet History, the podcast where we, Matt and Max, talk about works of alternate history, alternate history scenarios, and history in general. This episode is going to be a fun one. We're going to talk about the Spanish-American War and how, if things had gone differently, how an alternate Spanish-American War could have affected the world. Yeah, and this is, you know, this is a little more esoteric, I guess. We just sort of thought it up and I just sort of threw it out there and then it turns out there's a whole lot more to it than you'd think. Mm -hmm. And the Spanish-American War itself is kind of almost a blip in American history. You know, it's something that you go over like for five minutes in um, high school history class. And it's mainly, you know, there was the main and it blew up. Right. And then we invaded Cuba. Then there was uh, San Juan Hill. Yeah, exactly. And Teddy Roosevelt was a big hero. And then there we go. Yeah. Nobody knows anything about the Philippines. Most people probably don't even know that we went to the Philippines. Yeah. And uh, the Philippines belonged to Spain and became a U.S. territory. after. But basically, uh, you know, long the U.S. invaded Cuba after the main was destroyed And then we defeated some pretty, not half-hearted battles, but it wasn't a whole lot of fighting. The United States wins. uh, Cuba eventually becomes independent. The U.S. acquires Puerto Rico, Philippines, and Guam. And certain people, especially Teddy Roosevelt, really benefited from it politically. And in fact, it was one of the springboards for Teddy Roosevelt becoming the vice presidential candidate in 1900 and then becomes president in 1901 after William McKinley is assassinated. Right, right. So there's a whole lot, you know, we're sort of the divergent, any divergences would really have a lot of effect. Um, let's just get it out of the way first. Spain didn't really have a chance of winning this war. <laughs> no, not really. Because they already were putting down pretty serious insurrections in both Cuba and the Philippines. Right. So there's no, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on scenarios of, you know, the Spanish army marching into Washington, D.C. <laughs> Burn down the White House. <laughs> Or, you know, capturing New York City, marching in, you know, <laughs> all the Spanish army's not taking over the U.S., let's just say. And, Ta- and taking back Florida. Yeah, and, and the United States is not also invading Spain and making it the 51st state either. Yeah, no. um, we'll just get that out of the way and say that's not very realistic. It's really hard to say. I think really the main change would probably be more the war just not happening in the first place. Which is plausible, you know. Yeah. Like anti-imperialist sentiment was pretty high in America. There was a lot of outcry for the war when it was happening. Yeah, no, absolutely. There was William Jennings Bryant was a huge opponent. There was a whole lot of people who really opposed to it because they thought it was the U.S. finally stepping into the colony game. Right. And a lot of people were really hesitant about that. And Which, which is why the... Um, what is it? The Teller Amendment was passed. Mm-hmm. It's like, we will not annex Cuba. Cuba is mm-hmm. going to be an independent country. We're going to let Cuba go its own way right after we take it from Spain. That's right. But Ned said nothing about Puerto Rico. Nothing about Puerto Rico. That's <laughs> correct. So, yeah. So you've got the Teller Amendment. So really, any major diversion would be the war just not happening. Right. And, and I guess we try to differentiate this from our Cuba episode where we talk about the U.S. buying Cuba. So let's say the U.S. doesn't purchase it. Now Spain has to fight these insurrections and it's going to lose at some point. Yeah, pretty because, you know, you've got these big like grinding wars happening in the Philippines with like Emilia Aguinaldo and, you know, Cuba was like a a terrible like fight for the Spanish as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like it's not looking good for them. No, maybe they can militarily win for a while, but they just can't keep control of this these countries that don't want to be under their thumb anymore and at a certain point they're just gonna stop yeah they're gonna give up they're gonna cut their losses or sell it to somebody or something like yeah exactly so so cuba and the philippines will probably become independent at least cuba will maybe not the philippines but the real interesting thing that comes out of this is looking down the road is that if the philippines and guam are still spanish possessions like how does this factor into like world war ii it's a huge factor in World War II because like part of Japan's aggression towards the United States was because, you know, the United States had a presence in the Pacific. The Philippines is right next to Japan, right next to China as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, close to Japan. I don't know, right next. Well, it's not right. OK, sure, sure, sure. But it's in the neighborhood. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's definitely a threat to Japan which is like this militaristic, like fascist dictatorship playing the playing the empire game, just like, you know, Nazi Germany and USSR and stuff, trying to snatch mm-hmm. up land as much as possible. The mm-hmm. zero sum kind of thing to them. Conflict is inevitable with a with a neighbor that close to them. Yeah. So we're we looking at like a Spanish 
Japanese war at some point. Oh, yeah. Something yeah. that's contemplated by Harry Turtledove. That's right. And uh, he talks about the Hispano-Japanese war at some point, very briefly in one of the Turtledove books hmm. and one of the Great War books. But um, yeah, you could see. So that may, what is that set up? So, if, you know, Spain and Japan fight a war sometime in the 1900s, 1910s, maybe even 1920s, and they gain that. How does that change the face of World War II? Is there still a likely a collision between the U.S. and Japan? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe you know? not. And even if, it, but even if there is, it's on totally different terms because you know we don't have these forward outposts. Right. So I mean, Japan's probably going to orient itself with the other Axis powers just because mm-hmm. they're a, just because of like the way they run mm-hmm. their country. It's a dictatorship. It's not a democracy. It's uh, it's militaristic. But then again, you know, maybe not. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe they could be a member of the Allies. I don't know. Yeah. No. no. Anything could happen, I guess. Right. Give it. Well, you know. Give they it were enough. a member of the Allies in World War One. Something right. people forget. That's they right. They actually fought against. They actually captured a couple German uh, islands. Yeah. Islands and settlements right. in China. Tsingtao. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. They did, didn't they? Mm-hmm. They also took what is it, the Mariana Islands or something? Mm-hmm. What, wasn't it like originally the Bismarck Islands or something? No, nah, well, they did take the Mariana, the Northern Marianas, non everything that wasn't Guam, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, the Caroline Islands, like Truck and all that, and um, well, I mean, the Australians captured parts of New Guinea were part were actually under German control at the beginning of World War One. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Something also completely forgotten. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in that case, you know, a different Spanish American War never happening is really changes from that perspective a whole lot of stuff. But then also you have. The impact on particular politicians like Teddy Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And this was a huge, you know, San Juan Hill was a huge thing for his political career. And I don't think he would have been completely forgotten if not for this, because he had, you know, this adventurous spirit and also a lot of resources. But still, you wonder if no San Juan Hill, does he ever become president? Or even if he does, is it later on? Mm -hmm. You know, does he have to work his way up his way through the ranks a little bit more instead of, you know, being a national hero helps. Right, yeah, because his whole, what is it, volunteer regiment or whatever. The Rough Riders. The Rough Riders, that yeah. The volunteer regiment is the... Um, it's Turtle Dove, right. It's Turtle Dove, yeah. Duh. Whoops, we're getting our wires crossed here. <laughs> <laughs> what's reality and what's fiction? I can't remember. Uh, um. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, and that's a big deal, too, because mm-hmm. his uh, his presidency is very emblematic. He's one of the most popular presidents of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, well, he's on Mount Rushmore. He's on Mount Rushmore. He uh, brokered the uh, the Treaty of the Russo-Japanese War. That's right. That's where he got his Nobel Peace Prize. Treaty of Portsmouth. Yeah. Yeah, so without San Juan Hill, where's where's TR? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. is it just a completely different... You wonder. And that's interesting, and it shows you how important... I think this is a, probably a good theme for the episode, is really how these little things can really matter a whole lot. Because, not, to, not to mention the yeah. fact that, like, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, if he's not president... FDR is probably not going to be president also because he, he doesn't have like the the name recognition, the name recognition and the coattails to write on of mm-hmm. his relative. Yeah, no, absolutely. But yeah, I think it's a good just sort of overall theme is that like these little events really carry a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. Like you'd think like the Spanish American War for the amount of attention it gets in history books is way more important because in some ways it's America's really first stepping out on the foreign stage post Civil War. Yeah. Because if you think about, what do we think about post-Civil War, you know, 1800s United States? We think about cowboys and Indians. We think about westward expansion. We think about Old West. We think about, you know, the shootout at the OK Corral. Mm-hmm. You know, the consolidation of America moving west. But it's not until 1898, really, that the United States is actually making movements into the international realm. That it took, you know, almost 40 years after the Civil War for the U.S. to get to a point where it finally is starting to set settle onto the international stage. And you wonder, without a Spanish-American war, is the U.S. going to get involved in World War I? Stuff like that. Well, the U.S. was involved in putting down the Boxer Rebellion, weren't they? 1900, though. Oh, darn it. You got me. You got me. Yeah, I got you. Good point. (laughs) (laughs) But I guess maybe that's just the point I'm trying to make, is that like without the Spanish-American war to really invigorate the American desire to go abroad, Mm -hmm. is that going to change? How how, how is that going to resonate down the line? Will isolationism be even stronger? Right. Because right. there will be no example of the U.S. even really benefiting from any sort of foreign adventure at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know a lot of people oppose the Spanish-American War, but no one could really argue that the U.S. got the raw end of the deal in it. When was the annexation of uh, Hawaii? I think it was 1898 as well, actually. Wow. I think it was oh. pretty much simultaneous. 
So maybe like a Hawaiian independent country as well. It could be. Or, Certainly. There's still a Hawaiian independence movement now, actually. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. There's independence movements for everything these days. So. Mm. There's a Florida Key Island that wants to be independent. Oh, the Conch Republic. Yeah. I don't know if that's how much of a if that's a if how that's seriously a, they take that. Yeah. But. How how much is that is like earnest and how much is just a joke? <laughs> but um, back to the point is that this really is a key moment in American history, but it just gets sort of just blown over. There's just not a whole lot of attention to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But if the situation goes very different, we're looking at a completely different situation for the United States. Yeah. Um. It's just interesting to ponder. Not to mention the fact that, like, after the United States took the Philippines, they inherited the Civil War from the Spanish. So it's like this. It, it was a big and very bloody and gruesome conflict afterwards. Like, mm-hmm. nobody in America knows anything about it. But, like, something like 100,000 people died in that war mm-hmm. just between America and Filipino rebels. Yeah, it was a lot. I mean, it was a vicious. It took a lot of time. It took years to put down. And then you, even after the main re- rebellion was put down, there were still, like, the Moros... Mm-hmm. in the southern philippines even years later blackjack pershing mm-hmm. yeah I mean, it's just all sorts of stuff going on so really it, it's one of those overlooked events that we're trying to bring some more attention to mm. because if something different happens you know there is no main there is no the u.s avoids some sort of conflict with spain it really does alter the trajectory of of the united states in more ways than people would expect in this little conflict in which there was like three total battles you know, just going back to the World War II thing, like even if Japan maybe associates itself with the Axis, like the the tripartite agreement doesn't require any of the members to go to war on behalf of anyone else. No. So like you could just see Japan being like Franco or something, like this weird like outlier of fascism that outlives World War II. Absolutely. Yeah, it it would be interesting to see something like that if they never had to really come into conflict with the U.S. Because that's the primary enemy in the Pacific War. You can talk about the Eastern Front in Europe and all that stuff, but that is the Pacific Front. Is The main conflict is the U.S. versus Japan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. There's stuff in Burma with the British. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to demean that at all. Yeah, yeah. You know, without the central conflict with the United States. But, you know, now that you think about it, I mean, like, without the United States, maybe that's the the main push of Japan, like going into influencing like India and stuff, yeah. In, going deeper into China, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, going up into Siberia. You don't have to worry about your, your left, your, you know, worry about the Pacific front. You can really focus on land acquisition in mm-hmm. China, push into Burma, maybe even attempt to push farther into India, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Or push South towards Australia. I don't know. And maybe like a, um, like a, uh, Spanish, uh, Japanese war it gives the Japanese a bigger opportunity to cut their teeth on infantry warfare. Whereas, like, instead of being so naval focused after the Russo Japanese mm-hmm. war, yeah, um, which I guess hasn't happened yet. So, well, never mind. well, it depends on when the when if the Spanish are going to fight the Japanese. When's that going to be? If it's nineteen hundred, oh, then yeah, yes. good point. But if it's nineteen ten. Does the Russo Japanese war even happen the way it does? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Well, that was fought over influence in korea and manchuria yeah which i think there'd still be conflicts over that in this in this non-american philippines world no absolutely you're right well i mean it's not going to change everything well yeah yeah but no that's certainly absolutely uh we haven't talked about puerto rico and puerto rico just just a little bit we've talked about puerto rico Mm -hmm. um you know i guess they've probably become an independent country probably yeah doubtful (laughs) that spain's gonna hold on to it Right. You just, the idea that the Spanish Empire is going to last more than 10 or 15 more years past 1898 is pretty hard to believe. I don't understand why Spain wasn't able to hold on to anything, but the Netherlands still holds on to, like, what is it, Antigua or whatever? Yeah, Curacao, right? Yeah, yeah. Portugal held on to Mozambique and Angola until 1975. Right. Portugal. And Macau, too. Macau until the 90s, right? Yeah. It's like, what? That's always been weird to me. Like these tiny, tiny countries like Portugal are able to have such a huge influence on the rest of the world. Like Portugal that, you know, at its peak only had a couple million people living in it. And it's like, it's this giant kind of world power almost. I mean, I mean, it's, it's one of the, you know, byproducts of colonialism. Think about where does English originate? Mm -hmm. England. England. What what is the, what is the largest English speaking country in the world? It's the United States. United States. Yeah. Where's the largest Portuguese speaking country in the world? Brazil. Brazil. Largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. 
Mexico, I would guess. Probably. By population, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. So, I mean, there you go. That's the, the byproduct is that these countries have way more influence than... Well, that's the fate of empire is that eventually you get overtaken by the people that you conquered. It's yeah. like they inherit your legacy. Yes. They inherit your legacy. They don't reconquer you back. <laughs> and the UK is not the 51st state. <laughs> right, exactly. The, uh, the Ugandans conquer... Uh, Great Britain. I don't know. <laughs> Only an idiot means dreams. <laughs> uh. Well, uh, conquer it for Scotland. Oh, yeah, that's right. For Scotland. Excuse me. King James. I mean, <laughs> King James the third. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh-huh. No, it's, uh, it's, inter- it's interesting to talk about. This, this is brought up more than you'd think. You know, yeah. A little dinky little war in 1898 that really was. I, don't, I mean, I, I, I can't recall off the top of my head the number of actual like casualties from battle in the Spanish-American War, but I really would be surprised if it was more than a thousand. Like, I feel like it was one of those wars, and this was pretty common for wars before, like, World War One, where the casualties from disease far ex- uh, exceeded combat casualties. But I feel like in the Spanish-American War, I read somewhere where it was, like, ten to- five or ten times the number of soldiers who were killed in battle died of disease. So, like, when you look mm-hmm. at the overall number of people who died, it was, like, very minimal from actual fighting. Especially when you're talking about, like, the Philippines, you know, mm-hmm. and... Even the in Caribbean, Car- even in Cuba. I mean, because Cuba, is all, most of the soldiers who died there, I think, died of disease. It's like uh, during the French Revolutionary War, or, or um, back during the the French Revolution, the uh, the French sent all these soldiers to uh, what used to be Saint Domingue and became which, Haiti. Which yeah, it's Haiti. And then like they'd send guys there, and they'd immediately die of malaria. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. like the first couple of weeks they're there, they're already dead. Mm-hmm. Like huge, huge attrition. Yeah. That was actually um, one of the reasons why the Louisiana Purchase occurred. Really? Because they they like like we can't even hold on to like San Domingue. Hmm. Like how are we gonna how are we gonna hold on to, um, like this massive piece of land that we have on the right. continent that just. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you sell it. And like what are the borders? Whatever you want them to be, man. Yeah. Just go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, preferably as as far into Canada as you possibly can push it. Um, <laughs> Well, part of the Louisiana Purchase actually is now in Canada. There actually were some land swaps yeah. where, like, parts of what's now northern Minnesota used to be part of Canada, and that was swapped for, like, some of the very northern parts of the Louisiana Purchase. Wasn't, like, the border of Washington different as well originally? Well, like, the Washington, like, the Oregon Territory and all that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that stuff, that was up in the air for a long time because there was questions about whether the the British claimed it, and there's even like Russian claims on it at some <laughs> point. It was crazy stuff. It was just oh. all sorts of stuff going on. Did you know there was a Russian fort in Hawaii? I did not know that. That's true. I would have. Uh, well, Alaska wouldn't have surprised me at all. Yeah, but but Hawaii, it's weird. Really? Yeah, it's just on some random island, a the t- a tiny little fort, like nothing to it really. Huh. huh. You learn a new thing every day. That's true. That's that's the kind of hot facts you can get here at Talking in History. <laughs> that's right. I think we're finishing up for the day, guys. Thank you for listening. This is Matt, signing off. And this is Max, signing off. Have a good day, guys.